I'm not sure what you're like when you're waiting for something. I'm not particularly patient. It's not a very good character uh, uh, characteristic that I have in my life. And when we're waiting for something, it can in invoke two types of emotion. Uh, one could be a set of apprehension if you're waiting for some results uh, for something, perhaps a, a health situation or even an exam. Um, you could be uh, waiting for uh, someone to ask you a question or to go into a meeting. And it can be a set of, a set of apprehension or it could be a set of excitement, uh, a set of anticipation. You're really looking forward to something and you put any effort in, perhaps you're going on a holiday, you've bought a car or you're buying a house. Um, and there's that real ses sense of anticipation, excitement. Now, I like cycling. A lot of you know I like cycling. Uh, and I've got this really uh, mad sort of uh, enjoyment I like, sometimes cycling long distances up lots of hills. Uh, I used to enjoy something called sportives, which were sometimes quite long bike rides. Uh, I think the longest one I've ever done is about 140 miles in, the, in a complete moment of madness uh, with Gaz uh, from church. And uh, what turns the apprehension of that cycle ride? Uh, into a sense of anticipation is is how do I prepare for it? I suppose you could say in that waiting period, it's how we prepare for it that changes my emotions. If I put the effort in, I go out cycling in all sorts of weather um, and uh, take, take, take the hills in and do lots of distances. I get my bike ready. Uh, then I've got that real sense of anticipation. Unlike the fact if I don't prepare for it, then I get a real sense of apprehension. Um, I know I'm not even going to uh, complete the event. I'm going to struggle up every hill. There's not going to be any sense of enjoyment. And how does this work out in our lives as Christians? You know what? We've got the most amazing future to look forward to. It is a mind-blowing future. We are today, as Christians, citizens of heaven. That is our true home. Full of peace, joy, no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears. And the most amazing thing is every day, every second of the day in the new creation heavens, we will have Jesus at the centre of our lives. He will be a tangible reality. It's mind blowing. As Christians, because of our salvation, it means that we can value the certainty and reality of Jesus beyond anything else in our lives. When I became a Christian, uh, my ambitions uh, changed from self fulfillment uh, uh, through all the things that life gave me, all the, the things that life gave me, the stuff that filled my life. And I wanted more and more of, G about G of Jesus. That was my ambition. I wanted more and more of Jesus. Yes, I could enjoy the gifts that I was given. They were awesome. I was being showered on my, by God's grace. That's what I realised. That God's good grace was showering these gifts on me. But nothing could and nothing will take away the new treasure in my life. And that is Jesus Christ. You know, even here in his name, and I'm talking about it now, just, just fills me with joy. And this morning, as we continue to delve into the subject of giving, the focus will be, are that our ambitions in this life as we're waiting to go to the eternal kingdom, as they're highlighted, will show us what we value the most in our lives and where our real treasure lies. It's an interesting fact, isn't it, uh, in the capitalist world that we live in. As the well-known song blasts out, money makes the world go round, the world go round, the world go round, money makes the world go round, the world go round. But money brings arguments. Those who have got little want more and are jealous of those who have got more. Those who have more want more and more and care less about those who have little. Inequality cuts in at every stage. And as believers, our ambitions must surely be to put God at the top of our list. This passage is unashamedly about money. Jesus is not avoiding the subject. God comes first in our lives. 
in our motives, in our actions, in our business, how we talk, how we walk, what we do, what we do with our time, our lives, our priorities. And on the subject of money, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Listen to the phrases in here. They're, they're opposing miles apart. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And the word serve has a big implication in this passage as one as well. When you serve something or someone, it basically means that you are the servant and you are mastered by the subject of what or who you serve. There's a, there's a, a clear delineation of a, a master-servant relationship. And as Christians, we cannot have divided loyalties when it comes to money. God comes first. Serving him must be the drive and ambition in our lives. He is now our treasure. So let's delve a, a little bit further into this passage to see how Jesus unashamedly approaches the subject. First of all, what or who we treasure the most in our lives shows the ambitions in our lives. I have to be honest, I love facts. Uh, my brain is very linear. I am not very imaginative uh, or creative in my brain, and lots of people who know me know that. Uh, and I was looking up uh, what we spend our money on in the UK um, per annum. This is uh, from 2019, uh, uh, pre-COVID, so we get a better uh, sort of impression of what we spend our money on. Leisure. That's holidays, restaurants, uh, fitness, clubbing, uh, going to the pub. £755 billion pound a year. Beauty products. Now, I'm going to double the figure that I've, I've got because this is the figure for ladies that I know uh, men spend as much on beauty products as women. £20 billion pound a year. Cars, £51 billion. The debt of mortgage to mortgage, mortgages to mortgage lenders in the UK in 2020 was 1.455 trillion. That's 1.45 million billion owed to mortgage lenders. Interestingly, we, we gave 10 billion pound to charities. And it's difficult to, uh, to gauge the amount of total giving to churches through uh, the offering. Uh, but the Church of England in the same year uh, um, said their offering amounted to half a billion pound. Now, I know that in our lives, part of our expenditure needs to be spent on living. In the Apostle Paul, in the book of 1 Timothy, he himself says that uh, we are content. We are content in godliness, but we're also content when we're clothed, when we have a shelter, a roof over our heads, and when we have food to live off. But he also goes to say, to say those who want to get rich fall into temptation. And are trapped into many foolish and are trapped, sorry, into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people to, into ruin and destruction. This is to believers as well. For the love of money is the root of all kind of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Think of the phrase serve. We used earlier. This passage in 1 Timothy does not say is that you can't earn and make money. The Bible is full of businessmen and businesswomen who had money, and some had a lot of it, but they didn't serve money. They served Jesus. And that was shown in the, what they did with their finances. They opened homes up. Um, they gave to the poor. They sold field and land so that they could share with the poor so there was no inequality. And through their actions, they showed more and more of Jesus. And the message is clear. Jesus, as he points towards radical kingdom Christian living, says, don't let your spending power be overtaken by what this world has to offer, which can decay, which can rust, which can be stolen and destroyed 
As believers, citizens of heaven, we are told to put our treasure where our heart is, where it cannot be lost, wear out or decay, in the hands of God the Father. And notice the word um, store in verses 19 to 20. When we store something, doesn't it? It takes effort. When we store something, we've got to build up something to be able to store. But this word store also means a sense of security, keeping what you have earned safe. It makes sense if we value something, if we treasure something, if we work for something, if we put our time and effort into it to keep it safe. That's common sense. But Jesus goes on a little bit further. He differentiates between two types of treasure, earthly and heavenly treasure. And the one is affected by the reality of Earth, uh, you know, uh, the ecosystems, the climate, the weather. They, they bring decay. They bring rust. Nothing lasts forever. But he says what does last forever is heavenly treasures, a heavenly treasure that can never be destroyed. And that's God the Father. One good uh, example um, I've heard about uh, basically heavenly and uh, worldly treasures and uh, how uh, that, that can affect our Christian well-being and Chris Christian welfare is by Simon Gillibold. Of Agilio that's his name. Sorry, I always get his surname wrong. And he, uh, he was a missionary in Burundi, known as one of the most uh, dangerous places in the world. And you know, it didn't matter if you had loads of money in the bank there or if you had a nice house. Sometimes you just didn't come back. You were killed. It's a dangerous place. And that gives you a new perspective in life. And Simon said, uh, let's let's think of our Christian lives. Just just widen your horizons here. Think of your Christian lives as if we're going through a supermarket. Our life is so is the trolley that's in front of us. And he said, sometimes uh, as Christians, we can get the security from the things in life that we load into the trolley. Just widen your brain a bit. Uh, cars whew, into the trolley. Houses whew, oh, whew. Uh, leisure. Whew. Family, whoosh, tsh, health, and they all go into this trolley. And loads of these things are good. They're all gifts from God, and they're good. They're to be enjoyed. But he said sometimes we get our security from the things that we fill our lives with. And sometimes in an instant, I suppose the COVID virus has, has taught us that in the last year, sometimes they can just be swept away. The tsunami of life and its circumstances can sweep those treasures away. And if we've built our life on those treasures or we've put more of our lives into those treasures when they do go it can lead to anxiety depression uncertainty but he said what we need to do is look behind you and i suppose the looking behind can be the real treasure that we have in life jesus christ being citizens of heaven receiving the good gifts that God gives us. Look behind and you have the biggest trolley in the world. You can't even see the size of the trolley. It's so huge. It's so massive. And it has got gifts that you've never paid for. You never have to work at. They're completely secure. And those are the gifts that God gives us. The gifts that God gives us through Jesus Christ and what it really means to be a citizen of heaven. And he says, hang on to those gifts because they won't rust. They won't decay. Your faith that comes through Jesus is unshifting and it's in the hands of a sovereign God. <coughs> Let's not hold our punches this morning. As citizens of heaven, we need to be honest with ourselves. Jesus did not skirt around the subject of money. And as such, we should not skirt around the subject of money. If we are serving God, if he is our treasure, then we should be demonstrating that by where we spend our finances. As Christians, everything we have is a gift from us. He delights in giving to his children. And our ultimate contentment, our true peace, comes from the giver of those gifts and not the gifts themselves. I need to be careful when I make those statements or that statement. 
three need things I'd want to clarify quickly. I'm very mindful of time. First of all, our giving should not be fueled by negativity, not by a sense of guilt. God is not interested in sacrificial giving that is driven by a sense of begrudgingness or trying to earn God's favour. Those attitudes are not fostered by treasuring God or, or worship, as we looked at the other week. God ultimately wants hearts that love him and treasure the relationship that we have with him through Jesus Christ. We're amazed by his grace. Hearts um, that are stunned by the gospel message. Starts that are hearts that are stunned sorry, by the gift of unmeasurable love, which gives us hearts that want to give unmeasurably. Hearts that are compelled to give because of the life-changing message of all time. Jesus Christ has triumphed over sin. Jesus Christ has triumphed over death. Jesus Christ has triumphed over the gates of hell that we deserve. Jesus Christ has triumphed over the temptations and the chains of sin that has so ensnared us through the cross of Calvary. This morning, if you are not a Christian, the message is not to give, but to receive. Receive the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. This morning it is on offer to you. God, through the cross, is saying, take that free gift of salvation. See my heart for you. Look at how much I love you. Look at the cross as proof of that. But also, this subject is not supposed to be a burden. We can and we must enjoy the gifts that God showers on us every day. Family, friends, relationships, the weather, the country that we live in. He wants us to enjoy them. But also he wants us, as we enjoy them, to enjoy the giver more and more and more. Do you know, I love giving gifts to my wife, Tori. And what I love more than giving is to see her enjoying them, to cherish them. But also when she thanks me, and that's not why I give a gift, but when she thanks me, it gives me pleasure as well. God wants us to enjoy all the gifts that we have. But as we enjoy the gifts, we, he wants us to, to have hearts that love him more and thank him more. And that brings delight to God as well. And we also need to remember that God has a heart for us. We are his children. Yes, we're doing a series of talk on giving, but we're not doing this as a burden. God knows each of us individually. He knows family situations individually. He knows some families and some individuals in our church family who, who are struggling to put food on the table at the end of the month, who are struggling to meet the rent and their mortgage payments. He knows that and his heart is for us. But he also knows others within our church family through his goodness and his grace who of this season in life have left commit less commitments and more finances, more gifts that are available to be given, I suppose, to those who have less, to give to the work of the gospel message so that people can find and know the jewel of Jesus in their lives. Well, as we move on, our value and our ambition is also to find what people see in our lives. I suppose you could say the eye is the lamp of the body. As Jesus continues to unpack the subject of radical Christian living, he delves deep into our lives and he says the eye, verse 22 to 34, is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, the whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is the darkness? I remember as a child, uh, I used to be fascinated by art that depicted just the eye. There was a there was a shop called Athena. They used to sell lots of pictures. And I, I remember this one massive picture of an eye there. 
and uh, I actually copied that and I uh, drew that picture up and painted it and I had it stuck on my bedroom wall and uh, it, my my mind used to go at all sorts of places, my imagination was huge, and it was sometimes felt like I was being sucked into that eye, and I was being sucked into the very soul of the person themselves. I couldn't see anything else but the eye, but it was like I was being sucked in. I suppose uh, what I should have done is bin that picture, because it, uh, I suppose it uh, it helps uh, explain why uh, I suffer a little bit as a, as an adult from insomnia, but that's uh, that's another story. And the Bible often uses the image of the eye as a route to our very souls, who we are, our personality, what our desires are, what our ambitions are, what we love. And I'm sure my my wife won't uh, won't mind, um, but uh, sometimes when I annoy her, and that's pretty frequently, I have to be honest, um, she doesn't have to say anything. Sometimes she just looks at me. I call them her shouty eyes. Sorry, yeah. Uh, Sorry, Tori, I'm giving away a few of your secrets now. You can often tell, can't you, uh, the nature and value of people by looking at their eyes. They are like windows in to their souls. Now, remember that this passage is clearly about money. In the passage, Jesus says, and he uses the term healthy and unhealthy. Verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? I know many of people in our church family have had cataract operations. I remember speaking to a member of our church family not long ago and she says, Do you know what, when I after I've had my cataract operation, um, I looked at the streets and I could see things that I'd never seen before or things that I hadn't seen for a long time. In fact, she recounted the story of how she'd um, ch changed her dining room chairs because she thought the pattern on the chairs looked old and dowdy and she'd get one of them and put it upstairs, I think one of them, um, and she chucked the rest away. And then when her cataracts were done, she looked at the chair that she'd kept upstairs and do you know what? It was great. It's perfect. The pattern was fantastic. It was crisp and clear. And in fact, it matched all the rest of the decor in her dining room. But she'd had a new vision. She had had her eyesight restored. Healthy eyes physically allow us to see properly. Our paths are clear and our eyes are directed, aren't they, physically by what we see. But emotionally that impacts us as well. And when we see clearly, there is no confusion. We are at peace and decision making is easier. Biblically, the word healthy also stems from the Greek language. It means good. And the intent of the word in this passage is generous, open hearted, warm, giving up what we have for the sake of others. It can also mean eyes that are focused on something that is of value. Both ideas fit nicely into this passage. So how does that flow into our Christian lives? I've used that uh, that sort of statement quite a few times, hasn't it? Well, as our hearts are changed by the gospel message, then we have hearts that have a new vision of Jesus. Hearts that now have Jesus at the centre of our lives. He is now our, our focus. He is our, now our vision. He has become our treasure. Our ultimate ambition is to live for him and for people to see him more. Yes, that spins into our giving. But also our lives are an expression now of our heart. Hearts that speak louder than words. Sorry, hearts where our actions speak louder than words. We need to be generous with our lives as Christians. Look at Jesus. His generosity was unmeasurable, incredible enormous, all giving, all serving, all loving. And we want people to see him in the way we live our lives. But remember my warped childhood version of an eye as well. There's also, and I'll whip my glasses off, there's also the evil eye. Unhealthy again comes from the Greek language meaning bad. I suppose you could take evil from that word. Miserly, ungenerous, focused on things that aren't 
healthy. On the opposite end of the scale, unhealthy eyes give a blurred vision of life. Our paths are unclear and often that leads to anxiety and poor decision making. As Christians, if we take our vision off Jesus and he becomes less of a treasure than the gifts that he gives us, then that can blur our vision. It can make our spiritual eyesight unhealthy. Even on, as Christians, if our eyes are fixed more on earthly treasures, then that will become more of what we value. We will long, no longer value the giver, but instead we will start to value the gifts more. We will see more security in earthly treasures than in the hands of a sovereign, all-powerful father. And I'd, I'm sure, and we've all been like this at times, haven't we? There's nothing more. Um, uh, there's nothing more uh, of a, uh, a bad picture, if, if that makes sense, than someone who is miserly, ungenerous, uncaring. Nothing more off-putting than someone who's critical. And that ultimately draws us into the windows of their hearts. So let's walk the walk and not talk the talk. I'm going to finish this morning with a story. Um, it's a story about a lady uh, who was at a set of traffic lights in, in New York and uh, something happened in front of her and she was pretty upset. She started getting a bit annoyed and, and shouting. And... Um, Suddenly a door was ripped open whoosh, and a policeman dragged her out of the car and chucked her in the cells. And the next morning that plane, same policeman came in and he said, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, and she goes, why did she do that? He goes, do you know what? He said, I was behind you and I heard all this shouting and swearing coming from your car, all the angry gesticulations. And he said, and suddenly I looked at the bumper and I saw a fish. And he said, uh, that's a sign of a Christian, but... Oh, she must have nicked the car. He said, so I arrested you. He said, but I've checked all the documents and it is actually your car. Now, I know this is a bit of a satirical look at life. But as I've just said, as Christians, as we have Jesus at the centre of our lives and he becomes our focus. And that is then, I suppose, uh, externally shown to people. We need to walk the walk and not talk the talk. Yes, this passage is about giving and how we deal with the subject of money. But he also spins out into all the areas of our lives. As we are amazed by the love of God, this is an ex then expressed by the way we live our lives. We walk the walk and just not talk the talk. People see our hearts by our actions and deeds. They see Jesus through the same actions and deeds. We are human DNA that leaves traces wherever we go and for years after. One Christian executive was remembered, not because of the bonus that he gave to the receptionist every year, but the fact he was the chief executive, top dog. And what did he do every morning? We went past, good morning. Unlike the rest of the board, when she looked at them, just looked down at her and looked at her as if it was something they dragged off on the bottom of their feet. This man had had his heart changed by grace. We have all had our hearts changed by grace. And as we wait for the mind-blowing fullness of the reality of what it means to be a citizen of heaven in the company of the triune God every day, let's live out lives that have Jesus at the centre and that continue to leave traces of his DNA wherever we go. We're going to finish this morning with a hymn that uh, continues to be a challenge to me. At the cross, I clearly see a saviour who has surrendered all. He's come from the the glory and honour of heaven. He stepped into the world, become a human being at the hands of human beings. He's lived a full life without sin and honouring his father. And he's given up everything in surrender to us at the cross of Calvary. 
a saviour who has pursued me, a saviour who has captured my heart, and by his grace he has wrapped his arms around this sinful wretch and welcomed me into the kingdom of God. And the challenge to me is this, am I willing to surrender all?